Hi, welcome to my weekly web series, uh, Voice for Victims. I'm Jeff Herman, and this show is about sexual abuse and what we can do to protect kids uh, and protect uh, other victims and bring light to this, this very dark issue. Today's subject is about specifically protecting children from sexual abuse. And we're going to have a guest on later today who's an expert in this area. And so first let me just talk about the problem. The problem of child sexual abuse. It's prevalent. Uh, it's been out there, of course, since the beginning of time. But the problem is not getting better. It's estimated that one in six or one in five children will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. That's a huge problem. And one of the things that strikes me is that we spend a lot of time educating our kids about all sorts of things that potentially could be dangerous but often don't happen. Not that we should educate them about those things because we should protect people and, ed and, and provide education. But if you think about it, what happens when kids go to school in the beginning of the year? They do fire drills. That's great. We want to protect kids from being harmed in a fire. But we don't teach them about sexual abuse and preventing sexual abuse. And I will tell you that it's very rare compared to sexual abuse for a child to be harmed by a fire. It's much more prevalent that kids are going to be sexually abused. So why aren't we educating our kids about that? If you take a cruise ship, the first thing you do before that ship leaves is you do a drill about going to where your life rafts are and how to put on your life vest. Well, that's great. But there's a lot more people being sexually abused on ships than there are people uh, drowning uh, from not being able to know how to get onto their life raft. And so I'm not dismissing the need to educate about other safety issues. What I'm saying is that we do not spend enough time educating parents and children to prevent sexual abuse. Now, myself, I'm a child advocate. I'm also an attorney. I represent kids and adults who've been sexually abused. And that's a great way to prevent sexual abuse in the future. That meaning that by exposing predators and institutions that protect predators, we can protect kids in the future from being abused by, by those predators. But the better way to do that is through education so that kids are not sexually abused in the first place. This issue has been in the news a lot lately because I think a lot of victims are feeling um, stronger. There's collective empowerment because we are talking about the issue more than ever before. Recently, uh, Pamela Anderson, the actress, uh, came forward during uh, a speech she was giving and uh, surprised everybody by talking about the fact that she herself was a victim of sexual abuse. And we're gonna take a look at a, at a clip from that speech. I did not have an easy childhood. Um, despite loving parents, I was molested from age six to 10 by my female babysitter. I went to a friend's boyfriend's house and while she was busy, the boyfriend's older brother decided he would teach me backgammon which led into a back massage, which led into rape. So that was Pamela Anderson uh, very bravely talking about uh, being raped herself. And one of the things that I think is important for people to understand out there is that who are these victims? One of the things that we know now is that 90% of kids who are sexually abused are abused by somebody they know. It's not the stranger, typically, who's abusing the kids. You know, I grew up learning about stranger danger. That's a problem, but, but statistically, 90% of kids are abused by somebody they know. So what that means is that kids are being abused by someone their parents are probably telling them they can trust because the parents trust those people. That's the nature of sexual abuse. And so what happens is kids will meet, meet somebody that's in their life uh, who's a predator, and that predator will begin the grooming process will give them special attention, give them gifts, may give them something uh, inappropriate like alcohol or drugs or show them pornography. So the child feels engaged and involved, maybe they're doing something wrong. By the time the sex starts, the child is compliant with the sexual abuse. Now they don't consent, a child cannot consent to being sexually abused, they're a child. But they're compliant so as a complying victim, they think because they are physically participating in the sexual abuse that they've done something wrong, which is one of the reasons kids don't talk about the abuse, uh, sometimes for decades, sometimes never, uh, which is unfortunate because the silence and the secrecy is, is devastating uh, to the child um, and as they grow up. 
And that's one of the most damaging things about sexual abuse. And so we have to recognize that kids are being abused by people who we know are in their lives. And so the good thing about that is that education really can be helpful because we know who's abusing our kids. What we need to do is educate the kids and the parents and the other people working with kids so that we can take appropriate action and recognize those red flags and recognize when something is wrong and what we can do. So I'd like to bring in my, my guest today, Bridget Norman, who is the Program Development Manager for Committee for Children. So Bridget, welcome to the show. Hi, Bridget. Hi, it's great to be on the show today. This is such an important topic. I'm so glad you're addressing it. Thank you, Bridget. So um, why don't we start, if you could tell us about your organization and what you do. Committee for Children is a nonprofit based in Seattle, and it's over 35 years old, and actually started really in response to this issue. Um, the two founders were cultural anthropologists, and they were um, interviewing kids on the streets in Seattle, kids who were homeless, kids who were prostituting themselves. And what they discovered, much to their horror, is that so, so many of those kids have been sexually abused as children, and that's why they were on the streets. And so they decided they really needed to try and do something about that. And what they decided to do was create really one of the very first curricula to try and teach children some personal safety skills and self-protection skills. And that was a program called Talking About Touching. And it's been around, you know, since the 80s. So, you know, we have a long history with that. We then went on to create other programs that are really more about giving kids the skills so they don't grow up to be victimizers, to be aggressive, to have problem behaviors, really teaching them the social emotional skills to be healthy and to protect, you know, to give them the, the, the skills for well-being. Um, and so we have a, a very widely used program called the Second Step Program that teaches those social emotional skills. Okay, and, and, and Bridget, let me just, if I can interrupt you just real briefly, because you mentioned something that's important and there's a misconception out there about this issue that I want to address, because you talked about one of the goals of your programs are to prevent victims to becoming victimizers. Um, mm -hmm. That's important because what people need to understand is that while most victims do not abuse, most abusers were victims. Let me say that again backwards. Most predators were victims themselves, but most victims of abuse don't become predators. And that's important because there's always this, you know, this concern when kids are abused that they're going to become predators. And it's very important for that reason that kids get help because being a victim doesn't make you a predator automatically. And most do not become predators. So, Sorry to interrupt you there, but I wanted to just clarify that point. Um, I want to follow up now on, on the programs. How are these programs, these educational programs you're talking about, implemented into the schools or these other institutions where they're being taught? Um, you know, the programs typically are bought by either a school district or an actual, you know, an individual school, sometimes by an individual classroom teacher, and they're their curricula, their lessons, their sequential developmental curricula, they're scripted to make it as easy as possible for the teachers to teach this content in the, in the right way. They're designed to be very engaging for the kids. They're very interactive. They have songs. They have media. They have, particularly for the younger kids, they use puppets. And the idea is that, you know, that the teacher can do it in a way that's really successful and effective with the kids. Now, so the, these programs uh, are being implemented um, on a sort of voluntary basis if the school decides to purchase or engage in this program. Are you aware of any kind of laws that mandate this education like we have for fire drills? You know, in different school systems, there are different mandates that are given to the schools. For example, you know, Head Start programs have standards around personal safety and teaching some of this, and so often Head Start programs will choose uh, talking about touching program to meet those requirements within the Catholic school system, for example, there's also some requirements about child education. And again, there's some um, archdioceses around the country that have chosen our program to order to meet those standards. Um, you know, our program also just teaches these skills in a general safety framework. We also teach kids about, you know, fire safety and gun safety and to always ask first before they go anywhere with an adult. 
Um, and often schools do have, you know, health and safety standards they have to meet. And so one of the ways they can do that is by using our program. So, um, yeah, and the, and the programs are great. I'm, I'm generally familiar with, with, with the programs. And I know that as part of the educational process, you're also educating the other adults, which to me is maybe the most important part. Because what we know is that you can have all the safety rules in the world, but the predator is going to ignore them. The predator is going to look for ways to violate those rules because he wants to abuse children. So it's up to the other adults to recognize their red flags, to recognize that, hey, this other adult is not following the safety rules and that I need to do something about that. What sort of education do your programs have to train the other adults who can see what's going on and do something about it? Well, you know, that's a great question because, in fact, you know, we ourselves have realized that just teaching kids is really not what research says sh should happen. You know, the kids really can't, you know, have the onus of protection on themselves. It really is up to the adults. So we're, in, we're very close to the end of producing a brand new program um, which addresses all of the different adults that are around a child. It's going to have, you know, because mostly our uh, programs are taught in schools, um, it's going to have an online training for the school leader, but it also could be taken by a youth program leader, and it really helps them look at what is their child protection strategy, what do they have in place in their setting that is going to protect children from offenders who might, of course, end up in those settings, because as you know, one of the things we know about uh, pedophiles, about offenders, they go to where children are. You know, So for people who are working with kids to imagine that there aren't in their midst, um, people who intentionally want to offend with children, I think is, you know, is really not recognizing the reality. <clears throat> so we have these materials for principals to really look at what their codes of conduct are, their safe environment policies, their screening and hiring policies, teaching their, car their staff about reporting, and then making sure their staff have education around the issue. So we're also providing an online training for all staff to help them recognize child abuse and neglect with a specific focus on child sexual abuse, to know how to respond to a child and particularly to respond to a disclosure, or if they notice indicators, to know how to talk to a child without putting words into the child's mouth, you know, helping the child feel safe so they can disclose, and then to know how to report, because that's, that's very important. So, so Bridget, um, based on your experience, I, I'd like to see if you could for my viewers' benefit, give us sort of the key top things that you would recommend that parents be aware of or look for and things that they can do to protect their children from sexual abuse. Well, the first thing is they need to talk to their kids about it. You know, it has to be something that is, becomes as commonplace as talking about you need to wear your helmet when you're riding a bike. And there are ways that you can do that in a way that's not scary for kids, that's very developmentally appropriate. But if parents have a very hard time having those conversations. But that's the most, you know, one of the most important things they need to do. And as part of that conversation, they specifically need to teach kids the, the anatomical, the correct names for their private body parts. They need to have children know how to talk about noses, ears, penises, and vaginas. They need to know those words because when someone offends against them, they, they typically will often um, particularly choose children who they know don't have those words, who don't have that information, who don't know how to talk about it, and when it happens, don't even know how to explain what happened. And what so often can happen is that children will use maybe, you know, cute names and someone will not understand at all what they're trying to say. And the child may only try one time to tell. And if someone doesn't respond or doesn't understand, that may be the only time they try to tell about it. So parents need to teach those names. They need to have the conversation. And for young kids, it's particularly helpful to have more of a rule. You know, a rule we use in our program is it's, it's never OK for another person to touch your private body parts. So kids know that. You know, and just so they can come and say, someone broke that rule, mom. And then, the, then there's a disclosure. The other thing I think is very important is they need to learn how to talk to all the other adults that are around their children. You know, whether it be the childcare provider, you know, the music teacher, the sports coach, 
you know, the, the Boy Scout troop and ask those adults about their, about their protections that they have in place, or at least for them to know the parent is aware of that because offenders will not offend with a child if they think the child knows and the, the parent knows. Good point, good point. Bridget, um, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Very informative. Um, your, your organization, uh, if people want to, want to find you on the web, is www.cfchildren.org. And I want to thank you for joining us and, and keep, up, keep up the good work. Thank you so much and good luck with um, this issue, getting thank the word out. Thank you. So that was Bridget uh, Norman. Uh, she's the Program Development Manager for Committee for Children. Uh, it's great that these organizations are out there. So I want to talk a little bit now and I'm going to direct my comments to anyone out there, parents and, and adults concerned about protecting children, particularly parents. And I'm going to give it to you straight as I see it. There are predators out there right now looking for access to your kids. They are going to where your kids are at in the daytime or in the evenings after school programs. They're going to the schools. They're going to the youth organizations. They're becoming coaches. They're involved in educating your kids. They're looking for access to your kids for one reason. They want to have sex with your children. So what do you do about that? Well, as we just talked about, you educate yourselves and you educate your kids. But educate yourselves because your kids are no match for a predator. These predators are smart. They come in all shapes and sizes, all walks of life. And what you have to understand is there's somebody who is going to try to fool you to trusting them. So I'm going to talk now about some red flags that you can look for. And if you see these red flags, you must respond. You must respond. And let me give it to you this way. If you see a red flag and you don't respond, you don't err on the side of caution, what's the worst thing that happens? Your kid's abused. If you err on the side of caution, what's the worst thing that happens? You've offended somebody. Big deal. Get over it. Because your child's life is much more important than worrying about offending somebody. So what are those red flags? Predators um, are going to sometimes groom your kids by engaging them about talking about inappropriate things. They'll talk about sexual things. They'll cross the line what's appropriate for adults to talk about with kids. They'll want to spend time with your child outside of school. They'll want to spend time with your kids on the weekends. It may be a coach who decides to invite the kids over for a party. Now, does that coach have kids on the team? Is this an adult who doesn't have kids and wants to spend his Friday night with your kids? I will tell you this, the only reason an adult wants to be with your kid on a Friday night, and I don't care how cute you think your kid is, it's to have sex with them. So that's a huge red flag for you. If, you're, if this adult, an adult in your kid's life is corresponding with your kids over social media directly, emails, texts, uh, Facebook, you need to be aware of that and know that, understand that that's a red flag. Um, and what I'm showing you now, there's going to be some photos of an app that I have um, that's free to the public called uh, Safe Parent, and you can download it at all the app stores at, at Apple. Uh, and, and this is a quiz that you can take, and I recommend you take it with your kids, and you're going to go through these red flags. And it's designed for you to have a conversation with your kids about these red flags. And it will score your responses and your child's responses. You might be surprised to see that someone in your kid's life is doing things that are considered red flags. And if they are, you need to take action. So let's go on with some of these red flags. Uh, inappropriate jokes to your kids. Dirty jokes, sexual jokes that are not age appropriate. Uh, inappropriate comments about how beautiful or where your child looks. You know, someone may say your kid's cute. Doesn't mean they're a predator, but listen to what they're saying because it may not be inappropriate. Um, an adult who discourages other adults from being involved with the kids. For example, private lessons. You give your kid private lessons and the, and the teacher says, no, we really need to be alone for us to be able to do this sport or to educate your child in this way, bull. That's not okay. That's a red flag. You want to give your kid private lessons? Sit down with your kid during those private lessons and pay attention to what's going on. Now, there's going to be a time where your kid's old enough to understand where they can begin to defend themselves. There's no specific age, in my opinion. There's no cutoff. But think about it like this. The predator 
who is going to be abusing your child is somebody your child thinks you believe is safe, that you trust, because why else would you leave your child alone with this adult? So your child has to be old enough to understand that the person who's going to try to abuse them is somebody you told them to trust. Think about that. So when your child's old enough to understand that, that adults, and I don't care if it's, if it's family members, if it's a close, uh, if it's a member of clergy, or if it's a teacher, it doesn't matter. Your kids need to understand that these are the people who are dangerous. And it's a tough conversation, but it's a conversation you must have today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Have these conversations today. Um, an adult who touches your child in inappropriate ways, roughhousing, wrestling, this is one of the way predators will begin to groom a child and to bring down the resistance because the touching may start as, as tickling on the back of the leg and then it may move up. And so what happens is it's, it's a process because the perp is trying to gain the trust of the child. And he might do it right in front of you. He might be wrestling your child right in front of you so that, you're, that the child feels, oh, it must be okay because my parent, parents are watching what, what's going on. Um, an adult who asks your child to keep a secret, big red flag. Big red flag. No adult should have a secret with your child. And your kids need to understand that. Um, giving your child gifts, another red flag. That's a very common grooming practice where the, where, the, uh, where the predator, right in front of the parents maybe, is giving the child special gifts and wanting to, then they're grooming the, they're grooming the parents and they're grooming the kids because what parents don't want to see their kids get this, you know, new iPad or an iPhone or an Xbox or something. And so very, very common for that to happen. Uh, an adult that gives child drugs or alcohol is a big red flag brings down the child resistance. And so what happens a lot of times is there'll be a lot of grooming with special gifts, attention, and then they give the child alcohol and say, it's okay, it's our secret. Well, now the child thinks they've done something wrong. So when the sex happens, they're almost afraid to report it because they realize they've already done something wrong. It's one of the reasons kids will keep these things secret for a long time. Um, somebody who violates rules and encourages kids to violate rules. You'll see this at school all the time where teachers are like, ah, don't worry about that test, I'll take care of it. Or don't worry about being late, I'll do you, I'll do you a favor, I'll do you a solid. You know, this is a common grooming practice where adults are allowing kids to break rules because they're the adults, they're in charge. They do this and it becomes this, this slippery slope from breaking those kind of rules to violating personal boundaries. It becomes very dangerous. And so these red flags are key to know and to respond to. And I'm gonna repeat what I said when I started this. If somebody makes you uncomfortable, you must react. If somebody makes you uncomfortable, and I don't care if it's your brother, your grandfather, your uncle, your teacher, your coach, your best friend, if somebody makes you uncomfortable about the way they are around your child, then remove them from ever being alone with your child. If it means moving them from your life completely, then that's what you need to do. But they should never be alone with your child, and your child needs to understand that. Because if you err on the side of caution, what's the worst thing that happens? You've insulted somebody. But if you don't err on the side of caution, the worst thing that happens is your child's been sexually abused. And that's serious business. We all know that. So I want to show this app one more time. I want to encourage everybody to download it. It's free. You, you, you download this app, and it's a quiz. You take this quiz with your children. If there's somebody in your kid's life, and you may ask your kids, is there an adult we should do this quiz with? Or just do it with somebody you're concerned about and go through and ask them the questions. And then at the end, it will give you a, a reading of whether or not the, there's a high risk factor or a low risk factor. This doesn't mean they're a predator. What it means is that there's red flags, and statistically, based upon these red flags, and um, we've done this based on the research that's out there and our experience, that if the score is high enough, then you really need to be concerned about that and look into what's going on and, and ask at least ask more questions. But if it's in the red, my recommendation is you respond and do not leave your kids alone with that person. So. Today's issue, today's uh, conversation about protecting kids is important, it's vital. We want to protect kids from being sexually abused. 
we can protect kids from being sexually abused through education. Now, as you heard, my guests talked about a program that they have at, at, at some schools, but it's not a mandated program. I believe that sexual education, prevention of sexual education, should be a mandated program at every school around the country. And that when you enter school, one of the first things that happens at a certain grade level is there's this education program about preventing sexual abuse. It would be a great start. It would be something that is, is needed, and it can help solve this problem. And so parents, uh, take action. Talk to your schools. If your school is not engaged in these kind of programs, then tell them. Get involved in your PTA. Mandate that the school do it. If you're involved in government, then this is something government should be doing and mandating these programs. And so um, these are things we can do something about, which is why we need, all need to talk about it and take action. So thank you for joining me today. My name is Jeff Herman. Uh, this is Voice for Victims. This is a weekly show, webcast, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be covering all different topics, all related uh, to sexual abuse. Thank you.